Good morning. My name is Neil Bubke, and I'm the Director of Music and Fine Arts at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay. We're glad you're with us this morning. Uh, stand in your living room and join us in these opening praise songs. One, two, three, four. You move the mountains, told the winds and waves be still. You cast out demons. Bid the empty soul be filled. Now there's breakthrough. Now there's freedom in your name. You gave us power and the keys to do the same. Full redemption. Made accusers drop their stones. Showed us mercy with your mighty miracles. Now there's breakthrough, now there's freedom in your name, you gave us power, and the keys to do the same, now we in Jesus' name. in God's way. You have commanded your precepts to be, to be kept, kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. And then I shall not be put to shame, 
having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest storms of life may be thrown at us, he is Lord of all. Good morning, and I welcome you to our worship experience here on May the 24th. It is such a beautiful day outside. My guess is some of you might be watching this later in the week, and hopefully you're taking advantage of the blessing we have of sunshine and of warmth. Again, I want to welcome those of you who are not a part of our community of faith on a weekly basis typically, but because of this safer at home and and the lack of technology at your church, you have allowed us to help you with your spiritual journey. And and I really do appreciate the, the feedback that you've been giving and your support during this time. It is Memorial Day weekend, a weekend in which we remember those whose lives have been lost in the line of service, and I know that typically there are great gatherings out at cemeteries and the flags being planted, and even if we don't feel comfortable going out to those places, uh, we, we would never forget those who have gone before us. 
Well, I mentioned just a second ago that it's such a beautiful day today. That would have been nice last week. Can I get an amen? Amen. It was miserable last week. It was freezing. The rain was coming sideways off the lake. And yet, almost 60 hearty souls came out because they had a spiritual hunger, a spiritual thirst to receive Holy Communion. And we did everything that we could to maintain social distancing and to make sure that everything was safe. And what a, what a statement of faith that was for me and as a pastor, um, almost 60 times consecutively to, to kind of give the rights and to invite people to, to receive uh, the cup of blessing and the, the bread of life really warmed my heart even though my hands and feet were pruned by the end of the hour and a half. It also warmed my heart that many of those who came took those self-contained communion kits to their loved ones who who maybe cannot come out and and left them at at the porch for some people to come out and to receive. The most heartwarming story for me was Barb Abraham, who is such a faithful member of this church, such a dedicated volunteer in our office, and she came alone. And it's rare for Barb to come alone to anything that the church is offering. And and she took one communion kit home to her sister, Debbie. And Debbie was able to receive Holy Communion, what turned out to be just hours before she was born into eternity until God received her into her heavenly home. And I know that was very important to, uh, to Barb and, of course, to Debbie. Well, we're really hoping that we are going to be able to worship together in person on June the 21st, but we need to know it's going to look different than it has throughout the more than 100 years that we have been gathering together here at 819 East Silver Spring Drive. We have formed a strategic team uh, to put in place what it's going to look like as we roll out uh, being able to gather together again. We met last Thursday. We're meeting again this Thursday, and One of the important things that we're doing is we're putting together a worship covenant, not a list of rules that need to be followed, but a worship covenant, those those things that we can agree upon to make sure that once we are able to gather together that we do it safely, that we might not jeopardize even a single person's health. Well, I'm in week two of a sermon series called Encountering Jesus, and on Monday nights at 6.30, um, we're having a Zoom talk back where people can come and ask questions. Uh, Maybe if they disagreed with something, I always give permission for people to say, what were you thinking, or what did you mean when you said? And it's a wonderful opportunity. We had almost a dozen last uh, Monday, and I know that tomorrow night is Memorial Day night, but who can go anywhere anyway? And so at 6.30, uh, you'll have the opportunity to uh, get onto the Zoom. You can find the link for that on our church website, umcwfb.org. But if you're watching this, you probably already know that website, that website. And so I want us to continue into worship. And before we have uh, time with the children with Miss Christie, we have a, a special treat. Uh, Tony Case, who usually plays in our praise band, he is a mandolin player, he also plays guitar, jack of all trades, and when the church sings, the community sings, when we had that event, he even sang for us. And his daughter is an angel, and she is not shy. Can I get an amen, Neil? She is awesome is what he said. I'm not sure his microphone was on there. And so they're going to do a daddy-daughter uh, version of a song that will be our, our prelude into our children's time. So please receive this, this uh, video offering.
talking about encountering Jesus in the Bible. And I have asked some friends to help share some of their favorite Jesus encounters in the Bible. Hi, my name is Claire, and one of my favorite Bible verses is John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Blessed are the poor in, the, in, in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed, blessed they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hi, my name is Blake, and one of my favorite Bible verses is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do God's work, works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Thanks, kids. We're going to turn now to a song to get us into an attitude of prayer. It's called Mighty to Save. Oh! 
morning prayer. From the very beginning was your word, which spoke this world into being. Your word, which thunders from the skies. Your word, which flows like mountain streams and whispers in morning breeze. Your word revealed through kings and prophets and through angels' praise. You revealed, your word revealed in humble service. Your word revealed through the song of a child. Your word alive from the beginning of all things and to eternity. God, your word is the light we see, a guide for our footsteps to where you are found. Your word is the strength we find when darkness threatens to overwhelm all of us. Your word is the power we need to become servants of a heavenly king. Your word is the reason we live in the sure knowledge that you are everything. I'd like to raise up these prayers of our congregation Prayers for Sue Stanley's mom, Marilyn Stanley, who's in the intensive care unit with a blood clot. May God be with her doctors and nurses and provide her healing, strength, and peace. prayer from Pastor Matt, giving thanks for 28 years of marriage to his beautiful wife, Janet. Thanks be to God. Prayers of strength and healing for Lior Gaffney. May she know how very much she is loved. prayer for favorable test results for Russ Case this Tuesday. Prayers for the memories of the men and women who gave their lives in service to our country. Praise God for his many blessings and prayers for safe travels as we drive back to Wisconsin from Florida. A prayer of blessings to the praise team for their beautiful work in bringing the Lord's word to life. And finally, a prayer of thanks that Jan Han's grandson's surgery was a success. These are the prayers of our people, and now we come together as a community of faith and offer up the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before the ushers, uh, I was just about to say, before the ushers come forward to collect the morning offering, there will be no ushers coming to your front door. If anyone knocks, just stay at your computer and continue to worship without interruption. Um, but before I invite you to give your uh, tithes and offerings from the comfort of your home, I'd like to lift up one more prayer request, and that is for a dear longtime church member, Lynn Raffensperger, uh, who is dealing with some serious uh, brain issues. Uh, we're lifting her up and Mike up, and just hoping that the treatment that they're about to embark upon is filled with success and that both of their hearts are filled with hope. Amen. Well, I uh, think now that we've had that offering, um, we're going to do a video uh, of Mary Paul and Neil Bubke playing. Thank the ushers for their, thank you ushers for your good work, but let us say a prayer of a blessing over our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. So gracious God, we give you thanks for laughter. We give you thanks for grace. Lord, give us the grace to be able to laugh at ourselves. But Lord, we really thank you for the way in which your children continue to seek ways to live beyond themselves through giving gifts, through giving time, through sharing of their talents. And may that continue, Lord, so that we might move this world forward. 
All this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so as we move into the time of the word, a word today that's going to come through song, through scripture, and through a spoken meditation, I invite you to find a way to center yourselves, to open yourself up, that you might be filled with good news this morning. Thank you, praise team, very much for setting the stage for our message today. We are in the second week of a sermon series that is simply called Encountering Jesus. Jesus should be at the forefront of everything that we do as a community of faith that bears his name. Last week, I kicked off the sermon series with a sermon called Encounters That Matter. We meet all kinds of people in our, in our life, in our lifetimes, but but some encounters really do change us. They alter our course. They change our trajectory. And there is no encounter more important than encountering Jesus Christ. And so you can find that sermon and all the sermons that we do online, and you can watch them at any time that you want. But today, today we're going to take a look at the ways in which we encounter Jesus in the Bible. And I want you to know that this is an appropriate day, May 24th, to have a sermon talking about encountering Jesus in the Bible. We who grew up with the Methodist tradition, not just United Methodists, but there are other uh, faith communities that are out of the John Wesley tradition, we know that May 24th is a day called Aldersgate Day. It was on a May 24th where reluctantly John Wesley went to a church basement to listen to the reading of Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans. Encountering that words, something happened to John Wesley. He was already an ordained priest. He already had faith, but something clicked. And he said as he was there encountering the word, he felt as if his heart was strangely warmed. And he finally came to that understanding. He was able to accept that his sins, even his, as he would have said it, 
were forgiven. A powerful encounter, a day where the heart is strangely warmed. And you heard during the prayer time that this is my anniversary. And so we always say, oh, our hearts were strangely warmed on May the 24th. But friends, I want to encourage you to not let a single day go by without being in the book, walking with a text or maybe even just a verse of the day and walk with it every day and allow God to do miraculous things to lead you to incredible understandings, new insights. Because I promise you, we will never encounter Jesus in the Bible if we don't open the book, if we don't engage with the Bible. And friends, all of the Bible, all of it teaches us about Jesus. We can know Jesus because the Bible shows us Jesus. I heard a funny story. Someone once asked, what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? Do you know the difference between ignorance and apathy? And one man replied, I don't know and I don't care. I don't know if he knew just how right he was in that statement. I don't know and I don't care, but I lament that that's about how it is for many people when it comes to the Bible. Even people who have been lifetime worshipers, when it comes to the Word of God, they say, I don't know anything about the Bible and I don't really care. How sad that is and how dangerous that can be for a church. Bishop William Willimon used to be a professor of homiletics, a preaching professor at Duke uh, Theological School. He's now a a bishop. He used to uh, write a lot of, of study aids for preachers. And he said, congregations are formed by their confrontation with the Bible. He says, Scripture forms us, reforms us, And it challenges us, even as we seek to hide from the Word, as we refuse to hear it, and as we avoid, as we avoid and evade the claims that Scriptures make upon us. He says, show me a vital and healthy congregation, and I will point you to a people who take the Word of God seriously. So I have to ask, how are we doing, church? How are we doing? doing. Zan Holmes, who wrote the book Encountering Jesus, and this sermon series is only loosely kind of following his his outline there, but he talked about how important the Bible was for uh, the African-American community, especially during the times of slavery. Even when so many were illiterate, could not read, they would clutch a Bible. And he tells a story about one uh, house servant that, that the, the child taught this servant how to understand J-E-S-U-S, to know that if, if she ever saw that in, in consecutive order, that that was Jesus, and she wore out her New Testament, not even able to read it, but finding the name of Jesus. And it hearkened her to all the sermons that she could have heard. Now, for her, she only found the word Jesus in the New Testament, but friends, We're going to hear a little bit later that Jesus runs all the way through all of Scripture. Now, we know that there are times that we limit our encounters with Jesus by only reading our favorite passages, only the ones that make us feel really good and not reading the whole thing. But we must study, and we must study all of it. You see, the Bible is the church's book. It is meant to be studied. But it's meant, friends, to be studied in community. It is meant to be studied with other people. Indeed, the Word of God comes alive in a congregation or a small group when they gather around it, thus enabling the congregation and the small groups, groups of two or more, to go even deeper. To study Bible in a group, friends, makes it easier. And yet so many don't want to do it because they're afraid that they're going to come across as, as knowing nothing. But how can you know anything unless at first you acknowledge, right now I know nothing? Dig into the Bible. You see, the Bible can be presented. Jesus can be presented in a way that people can encounter and remember and understand an encounter that goes way deeper than just a momentary feeling of a heart being strangely warmed. We can encounter Jesus This Jesus who may not answer all of our questions, but certainly questions all of our answers that do not include his way. 
his truth, his love, his life, his grace. You see, this book is about a God who draws straight with crooked lines and keeps a seat reserved at the table for those who have not yet found their way back home. And that is, as Dan Holmes says, the gospel truth. In the book of John, in the fifth chapter, Jesus is looking at these people who are supposed to be these religious authorities, and he says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Or as another translation says, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Jesus is the way And all Scripture is testimony to Jesus Christ, who is himself the focus of divine revelation. Jesus is the definitive Word of God, and Word is Logos, truth. Jesus is the truth about God. At the beginning of John's Gospel, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him. Jesus who we encounter in the Bible, is 100% human and 100% divine. And you know what that makes Jesus? A 200%er, 100% human, 100% divine. And I want to let you know, he knew his scriptures, scriptures that we now call the Hebrew Bible. Adam Hamilton, who is the pastor of the largest church in our denomination, says that Jesus' Bible probably would have not been what we think like. It would have been a collection of 24 scrolls. We do know that in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus cites 23 of the books that we now call the Old Testament. But there are three, three that get most attention. The Psalms, the prophet Isaiah, and the book of Deuteronomy. But we have to notice that when Jesus points us to the scriptures of the Old Testament, he does not quote all parts equally. No, what does Jesus quote? He quotes those parts that favors, or he favors those parts that show God's mercy. And when Jesus reads the Old Testament, he sees scriptures as a foreshadowing of his own mission. Think about it. Ezekiel 34, the prophet is saying, the people, God's people are scattered, are being crushed because they have no shepherd. But later in that book, he goes on to say that God will send one to search for those, a shepherd who will search for those who have strayed and bring them back. And what does Jesus say? I am the good shepherd. I am the one that Ezekiel was pointing to. And he tells stories about leaving the 99 who are still very much a part of community and going out to seek the one that was lost. I know in my lifetime there has been a time where I was that one. And thanks be to God that that Jesus took those prophets' words and, and called himself the good shepherd and came after me finding me at the rock bottom of my life. That's not the only prophecy that that Jesus fulfills from the Old Testament. Some scholars say there is as many as 365 prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Friends, all of the Bible teaches us about Jesus, and we can know Jesus because the Bible shows us Jesus. Jesus even modeled this himself. A favorite story of, of many people happens on Easter Sunday. And I'm not just talking the resurrection. Of course, that's the pinnacle. But later that day, he is on this road where he encounters two people. They're walking back home, a a bit dismayed. Jesus was killed. He was crucified. And now there's this mystery he's missing. And they're heading back to their town in Emmaus. And Jesus starts to walk with them. He says, basically, why the long faces, gentlemen? And they say, are you the only one who hasn't heard what happened about this man, Jesus, who we had all this hope in? And then the Bible lets us know that beginning with with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted the Old Testament, all of it, about himself to be the realization. They encourage him to come into their house, and 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 it is in the breaking of the bread that they realize, here he is. In verse 32, these two men say to each other, were not our hearts burning within us? while he was talking with us on the road, while he was opening up the scriptures to us? There was no New Testament. There was no gospel yet. No. 
Matter of fact, the early Christians encountered Jesus very much to be alive forever through these two things that these men had, through the breaking of the bread and through the studying together of the Scriptures. The Old Testament's not obsolete. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, writing to a young pastor named Timothy, says this in chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. But as for you... Continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You see, friends, the only scripture there was is what we now call the Old Testament. And again, I've been telling you, all of the Bible teaches us about Jesus. And it has been used by people to to, uh, bring people into a saving relationship with Christ. On Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit got a hold of the disciples, they ran outside and they were so excited that people said, they must be drunk. And Peter said, not yet, but listen to this. And he talked with them about the prophets and about David. When Stephen was brought before people, ultimately to be stoned, to be one of the very first martyrs, he told them about everything that Scripture had talked about this Messiah. Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch and Paul. Paul said, I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said what would happen. Said what would happen. Jesus once said to a group who was struggling with him, you are wrong because you you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. To know Jesus, friends, you must know the scriptures. To know Jesus, you must know the scriptures. Maybe that's why you come to church, so you can hear scriptures being explained to us to see the power and the hold they have over our lives. But when it comes to the Old Testament, most people say, that's it, I am out. There is no way I can see Jesus in the Old Testament, they say, because the Old Testament God is so violent, so cruel, so different than the Jesus of the New Testament. And they have a point. If this is you right now, I'm looking you right in the eye and and you have a point. I mean, just think about what, what God kind of dictates in the Old Testament. There is a death penalty even for your own children that you should put them down. There is wrath and severe punishment for God's own people. And what most people really struggle with the most, it, it seems like God is commanding Israel to commit genocide against a group of people as they enter into a land that, that for hundreds of years other people had been living in. We can't take that lightly. We cannot ignore that. The task, one of the monumental tasks before preachers and teachers of the Bible is to try and explain how the character of God in these harsh and violent texts is consistent with the character of God revealed in Jesus Christ. I know I'm not the only one who has struggled with this. The human authors and editors of the Old Testament, say many, brought their own experiences and presuppositions to the task of writing. We don't often think about that when we think of the Bible. Adam Hamilton takes it a step further. He says, my premise is that the Bible is the words of people who were inspired, who were influenced by God, and yet were also shaped by the times in which they lived. The violence attributed to God in the Bible is a serious issue that all Christians must address. It is inconsistent with the character of God described in many places in the Old Testament and certainly inconsistent with the word of God revealed in Jesus Christ, who called his followers to do what to his enemies? To love them. And when they strike you, to turn the other cheek, to go the second mile. But we know it is the human story that throughout the ages, throughout history, we have tragically supported the use of violence to enforce the will of dictators, kings, and even in the majority in democratic societies. Violence and war in the Old Testament, though, tell us more about the people who wrote them and the times they were living in than about the God in whose name they claimed authority to do these things. Ugh, 
how easy it is for people of faith to invoke God's name in pursuit of violence, bloodshed, and war. Just because someone quotes scriptures does not mean that what he or she says is from God or is from God's will. No. So, we all wrestle with this, but the question is, do you know the scriptures and and do you believe them? Because not only is the violence hard for us to reconcile with, parts of it seem impossible to us. There's this great story of a little boy named Joey. And Joey was nine years old, and he went to his Sunday school class, and he heard the story of God uh, taking Israel out of slavery from Egypt to to depart from the Pharaoh and to, to move into the promised land. And when Joey got home, his mother asked what he had learned that morning. This is a great tip for parents, to to talk with your children about what they're learning at church so that you can continue that education because if they're not getting it at home as well as here, it's not going to stick. We are called to have sticky, sticky faith. So Joey looked at his mother and said, well, mom, the teacher about told us about how God sent Moses behind enemy lines on a rescue mission to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and how when he got to the Red Sea, he had his engineers build a pontoon bridge so that all the people could walk across safely. Then he used his walkie-talkie to radio headquarters and call in the airstrike when the Egyptians were closing in on them. Then he sent bombers in to blow up the bridge and destroy the enemy, and all of Israel was saved. His mother said, now, Joey, is that really what your teacher taught you? And Joey looked at his mom right in the eyes and said, well, no, mom, but if I told it the way they did, you would never believe it. Never believe it. Parts of it do seem impossible to us, but that doesn't mean that we dismiss it. We are called to engage, to encounter, and to wrestle with it in order to be blessed. I really want you to hear this. Perk up right now. You are not dishonoring God by asking questions of Scripture that seem inconsistent with modern scientific knowledge or geography or history. And you are not being unfaithful to God if you ask questions of a verse that seems inconsistent with the picture of God seen in the life and the teaching and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. What is your view of the Bible? Some say, is it a high view or a low view? The Barna Group is famous for, for their surveys, and, and they, a few years ago, showed that a slight majority of Christians, 55%, strongly agree that the Bible is accurate in all of the principles it teaches, with another 18% agreeing somewhat. But almost one out of five, 9% disagree strongly or somewhat, and 13% uh, uh, agree, agree with that, and 5% just aren't sure what to believe that's just within the church. What about the people in our country? One-fifth of the United States of America, 20%, believe that the Bible is inerrant, perfect word of God. 52%, when pressed, believe that the Bible contains God-inspires truths, reveals principles good for humanity, but people have muddled it up. 19%, almost a fifth of us, believe that this book is just teachings written by humanity. But that leaves 13% who are classified as Bible hostile. And they believe that the only purpose this Bible has in human history is, is to be used to manipulate and to control people. Now, we know that some people seem to worship the Bible more than its hero, to worship the Bible more than Christ. There's that great story of a a well-known scholar who went to a Bible college, and they were very nervous because he was being a little cavalier with the Bible, and he could see that they were murmuring, and the windows were open, so he threw the Bible right out the window, and there was gasps throughout the whole sanctuary. He said, there goes your God. There goes your God. No, that book talks about the God. Some people would never dare to wrestle with it, but we must wrestle with it in its call on our lives, what it calls on us, the actions in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Soren Kierkegaard, I had a wonderful semester-long class on Soren Kierkegaard taught in the, 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 at the site of the Gettysburg uh, battle. Soren said this, the Bible is very easy to understand, but we, we Christians are a bunch of scheming swindlers. We pretend to be unable to understand it because we know very well that the moment we understand it, we are going to be obliged to act accordingly. And Mark Twain said, most people are bothered by the passages in the Bible which they cannot understand. But as for me, I always notice that the passages of Scripture which trouble me the most are those which I do understand. Now we know that as Methodists, the Bible has always been central. The centrality of Scripture John Wesley had this quadrilateral, the four things that we can use to find God's will for our lives, and it begins with Scripture. Yes, Scripture and tradition, experience and reason. The Bible is central because in and through it we meet God. The Bible is central because it is where God shares God's divine plan. The Bible is central because through it we understand the nature of God that became flesh through Jesus Christ. The Bible is central because in it we find all that is necessary for holy living. As John Wesley once famously wrote, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach the way. For this end he came from heaven. He hath written it down in a book. Give me that book at any price. Give me the book of God. And so, dear friends, as we wrap this up, I have to ask, when you go to Scripture, are you looking simply for a historical figure? Or do you enter the Bible with an expectation that you are going to meet the living Lord, the Messiah? Do you encounter the Bible with any expectation of change? Friends, don't let a day go by without being in the book, walking with at least one verse a day, because we will never encounter Jesus in the Bible if we don't open the book, if we don't engage with the Bible. All of the Bible teaches us about Jesus, and we can know Jesus because the Bible shows us Jesus. Amen. And so we are going to sing a response to our word this day. And so if you are at home, I invite you to, to either receive this as a musical offering or to jump along as soon as you figure out the tune. Tell somebody about Jesus. Dear church, did you see me? I was the sinner that you walked by on the street. Dear church, remember me, cause you have something so beautiful something that i need you have something so beautiful i wish you would have told me so come on and tell somebody about
Thanks be to God that there are people who have continued to tell us, to tell us about the love and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Those people who have encouraged us to pick up the book, to read it, to wrestle with it, and to do so with an expectation that we will encounter a living God in and through those pages that speaks a truth that is timeless. May God bless you this week, and I hope to see you all back on the screen next weekend. Go and... Go in peace. I'm going to go in peace. <laughs>